when we talk about offloading, because it seems to be the paradigm that makes sense for physical light communication. And then I'm going to show some uh, illustrations of some of our uh, prototypes and, and work to date. <clears throat> and that is So moving right along, oops, wrong direction. Okay, so this was uh, when the when the center started. We've been around six years now. And the first year we started, we put out a press release talking about what we plan to do. <clears throat> and and interestingly, the the graphic still remains uh, true to the day, except that we back then we called things PDAs, now we call them smartphones. Uh, but all of the the concepts are really the same. We've got lights; they're going to provide data. We're going to interconnect to objects in the room. Of course, that's the Internet of Things. We want to stream high, high def video, uh, access various uh, mobile objects in the room and fixed objects. And we want to enable lighting to be uh, controllable and interconnected as part of this, this wireless ecosystem. Uh, so uh, now that we're in 2014, pressing the wrong buttons, um, there's some been dramatic changes. One is uh, the, the growth in internet traffic. The amount of data that gets pushed through onto devices like these smartphones is just incredible. And this is, this is growing uh, tremendously. So by, by uh, tenfold in the next five years, what Cisco uh, predicts. Uh, we're also seeing a huge uh, use increase in, in, in internet video, which is driving the need for increased capacity in the wired and wireless internet. <coughs> uh, the interesting things uh, about how the traffic is consumed is it's primarily indoors for mobile devices. Uh, and that's important because it helps us steer where we want to provide infrastructure. Yes, we use our phones and our cars, but actually we're going to consume it more likely the way you guys are doing it right now. It's indoors. Uh, and um, other historical things, the iPhone was created around the same time that we started. Um, and, and the, the amount of traffic generated from these mobile devices has gone through the roof. Because of the rich media, it's just driving uh, increases. Uh, people are using these more, so the user behavior has changed, the, the ability to consume data has, has changed, and the applications um, uh, have changed. Um, and over the next five years, we're looking at 61% uh, cumulative growth each year um, in this field. So if I were a, 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 you know, a money to invest, Wireless is just going through the roof. The, the growth rates for uh, capacity are staggering. Um, and, and we're seeing increases in things like mobile video for these devices. Uh, interestingly, Wi-Fi is increasingly used for fixed positions. That means your laptops. They're not, they're, they are mobile devices, but they're not moving. So we can optimize the delivery of data to those devices as though they were fixed and immobile devices. Very important. Uh, and, and that's a large fraction of Wi-Fi traffic today. Uh, <clears throat> a lot of um, more devices coming to the Internet of Things. Uh, through wearable devices, we already have a lot of traffic generated by wearable devices going up um, very quickly as, as connected health uh, comes on board. And then there's some weird things happening around um, devices. Nest was acquired for $3 billion. Um, it's a thermostat. It's a thermostat company. And uh, the, the value of these connected devices is clearly uh, being demonstrated in the marketplace. Um, so what else is going on? Uh, offloads are expected to increase. So the, this, this is traffic from, that would typically be done by a mobile carrier. It's now being pushed onto Wi-Fi networks. Why is this important? Because we want to do the same thing with our optical networks in a, in a better way. So the, the carriers can't keep up with the traffic so they absolutely want a way to, to, to accommodate the needs of user behavior by using local access networks. And this is being done today and expected to increase as we go. The other thing that's happening is, um, is you know, I mentioned that there's a, a, a huge uh, increasing consumption of, of um, IP video that's, that's growing, but it also has created a, um, a substantial uh, peak period. So what they call a busy hour period is typically in the evening when people come home and now watch video from their wireless devices. It's created this, this peak problem, uh, which uh, makes provisioning these networks more difficult. 
you get a very high, long, not, not a bursty peak, but a single peak period. Uh, that means you need to provision for the worst case. And again, this is a, another argument for how some of the local access, access networks can help mitigate um, some of these wireless bottlenecks. So a summary of what's going on is a lot of text here. Uh, more wireless devices, they're fixed locations, indoors, uh, more traffic. It's typically asymmetric because the video is downloaded. Uh, we have more users uh, with you know, increasing use of smartphones. We're not really getting more spectral efficiency from the existing uh, uh, schemes we've got today. Uh, carries won't offload the traffic. And, and the, you know, the punchline here is that the lights are, are in the right place. So we, we can deploy an array. And, and this morning, I had a chance to see your orbit lab. It looks th that's the ideal configuration for, for delivering data to a lot of people. Uh, if the lights are already there, we'd like to piggyback uh, data on these access points. We look at this as light, but it could certainly be uh, other media. It could be, other media it could be uh, 60 gigahertz, for example. So these are uniquely placed as access points. So in, in the center, the work I'm involved in is uh, around this optical wireless communication, but there's a, there's a broader mission. You want to think about legacy lighting and converting that to something more exotic, where we can render uh, many different colors we want to have full color lighting. We can change the, the spectral uh, 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 components of the light in, in, in different amounts. We want to be able to render patterns in the space. We might want to do lighting on the walls or on the floor. We want to um, uh, provide lighting that meets human needs and, and meets uh, health requirements. And we want to stream data, as I've, as I've just been talking about. So you know, a manifestation of that might be something there. We've got full spectrum lighting. Um, coming down onto a user and, and delivering data at the same time. We have a sensing and control component, which is important for things like uh, localization and color control and optimizing uh, energy savings. That all play out in our, in our center goals around health improvements, energy savings uh, uh, opportunities, and then increasing productivity through better data access. Um, so that's sort of the, the, the nickel tour of the center. Um, there are uh, uh, different use cases that we think about with, with visible light communications um, uh, that, that play out around uh, some of the controls. The so self-provisioning, this idea that you could install a light and then it would self-configure to the lighting needs as well as the data communication needs. Uh, there's a need to interconnect various um, Internet of Things devices for, for uh, industrial automation or, or home control. Uh, and then there's this theme of general wireless access. Uh, when we have these discussions, clearly uh, these functions don't require a uh, very rich data set. They can be done at a, at a modest data rate. But for general wireless access, we need a much higher capacity. So we think about those two as communications for the purpose of control. And then if we're doing general wireless access, it's probably uh, going to encompass the other functions. Once you have high speed access, you can satisfy the other paradigm. Um, so our, our smart light then becomes something like this, where we've got you know, our legacy bulb. And our new device has a light engine, you know, the physical manifestation is a light engine. It has some sensors. It's got a network interface. It might be wired. And it's got uh, power. Power could be PoE. And then logically, it's really got two components. It's got a, um, a VLC part that's going to provide a channel for delivering optical wireless communications. Probably, or at least the way we envision it, it's, it's Ethernet to, um, to um, 802.15.7, which is the VLC data communication standard. The other part is uh, the controls part, which is the addressability of the light to be able to do the control and sensing that we might want for things like uh, indoor positioning or adjusting the light for, for human needs. We, we treat those logically as different things. And it allows us to decompose and, and, and operate them separately. Um, so one way to think about the control problem, <clears throat> one of the things we'd like to do is, is uh, mesh network the lights, have the lights without any infrastructure communicate with each other. Um, and, and one model is they, they communicate to their nearest neighbors in a mesh. We're just thinking about the controls problem. That's how we think about it. Um, 
in, in the controls context. So what, what would that mean? Uh, my colleagues at RPI are working on these future lighting systems where we have sensors that are in the light field that in real time allow uh, updating the set points on, uh, the, on the license actuators to control red, green, blue, yellow, amber light settings to, uh, to, to deal with perturbations. Perturbation might be sunlight coming into the room, might be occlusions, might be changes in the material or the clothing worn by people in the room that change the, uh, the, the lighting uh, sense value. Uh, so that's so the, these sensors are located at, at these lights, or where are they? Uh, it, it's, it's an open question. Currently, we will put sensors uh, on the tables and all through the room, or we'll mount them on robots that will roam through the room to, uh, to do some kind of sparse sensing that's mapped to the control barrel. Uh, if you ask the controls people, they'll want sensors everywhere all the time at high temporal sampling, but the reality is that the uh, the, the, the back of the envelope calculation says you need about a megabit per second continuously to meet their their current uh, control needs. So real time response, um, uh, say 10 hertz sampling uh, with, with peak resolution for many lights. It turns out to be a lot of data being passed around. Um, so that's an open question. This I'm showing a centralized model here, but I think more typically it will be it will be localized and hierarchical. Um, you know, Zigbee and RF technologies, Bluetooth, Bluetooth LE, Wi-Fi, there's, there's a variety of uh, technologies in the lighting industry right now that are competing for this business. So we want, a lot of people want to control the lights, um, but it's really not clear yet uh, how this is going to play out, especially in a, in a dense, densely populated <laughs> network of lights, because the amount of data is, is quite substantial. So if the back of the envelope calculation is a megabit per second, you know, Zigbee isn't really designed to handle that, so you need some way to partition the network and mitigate some of the, the uh, congestion it, it, with, with this omnidirectional media. So for general data communication, what we want to do is, is create these um, downlinks. We very much view VLC as a downlink technology because visible light going up is not satisfying to humans. Coming down, it's, it's you know, out of your field of view, it's okay, but going back up, it needs to be something else. So we have begun to model our systems as a asymmetric technology. It's going to be an additive uh, capacity to existing uh, communication channels. So if we have um, Wi-Fi already, we will greatly supplement it by adding this VLC channel, this, this data downlink will offload capacity onto that and be able to reduce uh, congestion that already exists in the RF channel. Um, so it's, it's, it's how we think about this problem, asymmetric and cooperative or, 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 or heterogeneous. Um, there's a question about how fast do these links need to be? Any, any speculations? Um, we, I love this graphic from Verizon that says, you know, more is better. You watch TV, you get bombarded by this ad. And he, he asked the kids, you know, do you, you know, what's better? I forget what he's asking in this particular commercial. But the, the, the question really is answered by, yeah, of course I want more. More is better. Um, and and the, for us <coughs> and, and VLC, we ask the same question. What, what would be significant for adding capacity to a room like this? If, if I could add 10%, no one's ever going to find this. It doesn't have a chance. You know, existing RF, you know, it doesn't help. 50% improvement, well, that's something, but it's not a lot. 100%, if I could match the capacity of existing um, RF systems, I, I think I'm starting to be in the ballpark where there's value in a, a new optical communications medium that's, that's not expensive. It's got to be it's got to be the same ballpark, performance-wise and cost-wise. Um, scalable, though, is pretty interesting. So. You know, scaling Wi-Fi, adding more access points doesn't necessarily give you more capacity. But if that's a property of the optical channel, um, I, I can sell that. I, I can add capacity by adding more of these uh, these downloads. So, so this improvement is like, it's a, you're comparing it to <coughs> Wi-Fi? Compared to Wi-Fi, yeah. If, if I compare it to something like uh, 60 gig, I think your arguments are very similar. It's, a, it's These isolated, sequestered channels um, have real value. 
Um, and then, you know, the, the, the current plan in, in some uh, calls right now is to scale by a thousand. We find a thousand X more capacity in our wireless channel. Um, and, and the answer is, well, maybe. Um, how are we doing that? Well, um, others have suggested that you do this three ways. You know, you know more spectrum or, or better spectral efficiency um, through uh, uh, MIMO or, or um, better uh, modulation techniques or increasing the density. And this is where the directional media has a real advantage. We can get more of the, um, more of the spectrum delivered and reused in, the, in a small volume. Um, and that's, that's really what we can, uh, can work on, although we can also make some gains in the other, the other dimensions. Um, so how do we do this? Small cells, this is your, your you know, classic macro cell serving a big footprint. In, in a small cell, um, we would um, create smaller and smaller cells that service uh, a multitude of, of areas, and thereby increasing the overall capacity for the same footprint. We want to do the same thing in the context of a room like this. Um, you know, for example, here's a, here's a picture of a macro cell and a small cell <coughs> uh, in close proximity. Interestingly, this small cell is located on a street lamp. So there's this synergy between the positioning of lighting and where we want to do wireless access. And, and indoors, that's where we want to exploit that. Um, you know, the industry is, is following the same trend. This is just a graphic, a little dated, uh, that, that shows how AT&T is rolling out many Wi-Fi access points to meet the data consumption demands of smartphones and has a strategy to make this, this ubiquitous because that's the best way to get traffic off of the current mobile carriers networks, in this case AT for Wi-Fi, uh, AT&T's, by having, having these very localized small cells, in this case it's Wi-Fi. So using the term small cell um, to, to encompass uh, the, the you know, Wi-Fi te technologies as well as replicating the mobile carrier in a small region, which is what a typical small cell does. Um, so how does this work? Here's a little graphic that shows some of the benefits. If this is speed versus mobility curve, where you know cellular is really good for mobility but not so good for speed. Uh, wavelengths are in the middle, and these directional technologies are, are fast, but they're terrible for mobility. So in this cooperative or, or, or small cell or heterogeneous network model, uh, first of all, we can improve our speed um, by um, by, by having uh, better use of the spectrum, and that can affect all of these technologies, raising the curve. Um, and then we can also do the offloading, which basically moves us um, from uh, you know, down in the mobility direction, but up in the speed direction. So when we offload the cellular, we get that kind of gain, and we offload to VLC or 60 gigahertz, we get another speed gain, but we give up some mobility. And this is all possible when we localize people in a small space and then we put them underneath access points where they don't need a lot of mobility while they're at that fixed position. So this is what we focus on in, uh, in, when we develop these wireless access points. Um, this is also consistent with the march towards smaller and smaller cells. We're just going to put ourselves uh, down here uh, at, a, at a cell radius, which is in the order of a meter. Cell rate is one meter, or in a room like this, maybe we need a little bit wider than that. But you can see where that's going. Um, you know, how does the directionality improve density? Uh, you know, that's that's your disk model for uh, RF. Um, we if we can narrow that down. That's going to give us um, a better better reuse of that that signal. If we can make it even narrower, it's better, so a, a narrow field of view like light. Or if we go down to something which is you know pencil thin like a laser, we're gonna have the we're gonna have a wire replacement. You know, one laser beam replacing uh, the, this this omnidirectional channel. So at, at this this right hand side the visible light communication has a distinct advantage in its ability to sequester. Um, and in the middle, interestingly, is where we're operating which is this idea of dual use. We, we know we want, we're not going to use lasers. The lasers don't provide light. We want to 
piggyback the optical communications on the lighting, providing the lighting and the control, and also exploiting its ability to deliver data. So we want to do both of those, and that's the, the mandate we have to operate in our, in our research setting. Um, we can also do some other things. Beam steering is pretty interesting. Um, and, and the idea is, you know, we can change the inversion order, which is another way of saying the, the width of the beam. Um, and we, uh, you know, done some, some analysis. If you look at a device and you move it across a room with uh, a number of, of lights where we can control the inversion order, uh, essentially the focus and the, and the, and the beam position. Uh, we, we do some analysis there and uh, we come up with uh, results for the improvement in SNR and the distribution of light. So the, the goal here was to have the um, have a, a, a peak of 400 lux at the surface of the table um, with the lighting. So um, the different curves, this first one shows um, a Lambertian order of one, which means fairly wide field of view. Um, and it, <clears throat> it gives um, uh, sort of a low SNR improvement, uh, but it's, it's pretty broad coverage. If I narrow all the beams down, I end up with uh, this kind of distribution, which is a little bit peaky, but it gives me some improvement <coughs> on the SNR. Um, but unfortunately, it gives me a very uh, sharp uh, distribution of light towards the middle of the room. So it's better SNR, but not so good for lighting. So there's trade-offs in the lighting versus the signal quality. And then the third case, uh, what we're doing is we're not only focusing uh, a, a beam, but we're also steering the beam. So we, as the, as the device moves through the space, we focus the nearest one onto the device to, to maximize <coughs> SNR, and all the other ones stay um, a, a, a wide a diffuse light, and we end up with um, kind of the best improvement in terms of SNR, but we also end up with a very peaky distribution of light. So there is some sensing and control that's telling these lights where, who's moving where, or how this is moving? So in, in th this is actually an application where uh, knowing where a device is important. You know, it's a place where localization is important. If I knew, you know, down to the you know, 10 or 15 centimeters where a mobile device is, I could then direct the light. Right, so your the, your sensing and control plane is stuff. Yes, planes. you're playing together in this, absolutely. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a motivation for us to investigate beam steering as a, as a way to prove the, uh, the SNR and hence the data rates. Um, and, and in fact, we're doing that with, um, uh, we've got a, go ahead. Sorry, the, the steering is this physical movement of the, how does that work? That's yes, so we've got uh, two ways we're doing this. One is with um, uh, a mechanical servo. So we, we have a, a light uh, center of the room and uh, I'll, I'll show you a picture of it later. And it can track the device through the space and deliver light just to that. Uh, it's not really practical in a widespread sense. What we'd really like to do is embed a MEMS device in every bulb so every bulb is steerable. And it's, it's a twofold, uh, it's another dual use. If I could tell that light to, to wash that wall, uh, I, could, I could rearrange the design of the lighting uh, through MEMS devices, it would all be programmable. Um, and that's a big win. Uh, but we also would be able to direct the light to improve the SNR at, at the receiver. Um, we're doing that with, uh, we're, we're really investigating, we've built some of these things with these MEMS devices that can tilt and they can change their shape. Um, so they can go from this, this, um, this, this bowl shape to flat, and I think they can even go beyond uh, flat. Um, and, and some uh, just small aperture, or there's some lensing. Or uh, the open question is how to scale this to um, to, to a lot of light. We're doing this with single units, and we can do it with a laser beam. Easy to demonstrate with that because it's narrow. Um, so the, you know, how many of these does it take? How efficient can they be uh, in in projecting the light? Is is the the MEMS problem? Um, so right now the, the, the range, the deflection is quite good. Uh, there's another slide I'm not going to show, but it, 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 this, this is uh, one position. This is another where it's focused. Here it's, it's kind of flat 
uh, the flat reflection off the surface. And the ability to, to, to um, swing through an angle is, has been demonstrated. So I think it's, and, and I've also learned that the, uh, the cost of this is very low. So that in quantity, these are expected to be 10 or 20 cents a piece. If you think about adding directionality to the, to the ability to project light, uh, it can be done at a pretty low cost. So I'm not a men's expert, but that's, that's pretty exciting. Um, and then I mentioned that, that we could do this with a mechanical device. We've got a device like that, which is um, interconnected to an optical tracking system. So we don't have a clever localization system. We, we've you know, done research on how to do this. Uh, but to really get it to work, we, we put together an, an optical camera-based tracking system that gives us very precise positioning of, of optical tags. And we've now got that um, in our test bed so that you can, you, can, you can carry one of the tags and the light will follow you around the room in real time. It's, it's a very slick demo. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't turn to video for demo because it's, it's very, it, it works too well. Uh, um, so, so uh, this is some, some marker you put on your head? It's, it's, a, it's a tag. It's a, it's a, um, a reflector. Reflector? Yep. <clears throat> and then there's a camera somewhere and... Uh, 12 cameras. Okay. So, so here's the problem. It's a, it's a reference, golden standard for positioning, used for motion capture in, in making, uh, you know, motion pictures. Not that expensive, but but we really want to figure out how to develop sensors that get the same information, ideally in a privacy-preserving way, which is a lot of debates about what that means, um, and 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 inexpensively and reliably without too, producing too much data. Um, the these system is called OptiTrack, is it? Yeah, yeah, OptiTrack. I think I've got another picture later. Um, uh, great stuff. These are used for uh, uh, real-time flying of quadcopters and things like that in the universe spaces. But it requires a, a, a volume that you shoot into. Uh, but so the uh, so, you know, it's a, it's a working system where the OptiTrack uh, collects the data, uh, connects to a, a machine that does the analysis. We use something called DMX over Ethernet, which is a, it's a hack. I mean, this is, it's just a servo mechanism we could drive with an Arduino, uh, but it's, it's multiple interfaces. We also have the ability to dynamically control an array of lights. So it's, if instead of steering the light around in different places, we could just have the lights energize when you come underneath them. Um, again, it, these are applications enabled by having uh, position information. Uh, when we think about our systems, we, it, it's, it's converged. Uh, we want to have VLC as part of the system, and we, we want to have RF. We, we think it's available that there's Wi-Fi. So our systems will be uh, set up so that we'll exploit the availability of VLC access points, but we'll always have background Wi-Fi. And one of our development challenges is to build protocols which will dynamically and, and with low latency um, achieve the switching between the, the, different, um, the different channels, if you will. Um, so as, as we go between access points, we, we have to do handover. Uh, as we move out of the range of an access point and move purely on the Wi-Fi, we need to manage that uh, and, and so forth, and, and throw in and additional media. So that our belief is that, that future systems like this will be very heterogeneous and will we'll take advantage of the best media available. Um, you know, this is an old curve, uh, just showing that it, it, this kind of system is scalable. So if you, um, you know, if, if you want more support more users with additional capacity, you, you just add more access points. And if they're properly distributed in your space, and, and that can be the case because we can't all occupy the same volume, um, lights tend to be spread out in the space, then we can get additional capacity. So, so what is the cost benefit analysis of adding another Wi-Fi as opposed to this? Um, let me see if I can explain I, okay. in, in different terms, in okay. terms of congestion. So, you know, why not Wi-Fi? Right? Yeah. 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 Um, so this is this is exactly my office. I've got a bunch of wireless devices. I probably more than three. Um, my my neighbor, uh, Christos Cassandras and Ari Trachtenberg have devices too. 
um, and they're served by an access point, which is somewhere in the hallway. And we all share the same the same medium. Okay, that's that's the reality. And um, you know the signal is is contained. So if I add another access point, um, you know maybe it could be a five gig access point, and I get I'd be really getting it for band. That would have value. If I add another one in the same band, I'm just going to put more people in in the party. They're going to use that capacity. You know if I look at the the floor I'm on, it, it's essentially that. Now it's not quite that bad because there, there has been an effort to. Uh, to, to try to partition the floor a little bit better than this. But it's many devices, they, they compete for the same spectrum. Um, on the other hand, if you look at a light-based communication, every one of these rooms is sequestered. So there's an opportunity for the, the light-based communication room to only be in here. It doesn't, doesn't leak out. And that's an advantage to the sequestering of the signal. Um, uh, so that's that's the case, but the, you know, I, I, to be fair, it's really the same case for any directional media we're, we're looking at. Like, um, you know, I mentioned we, we think it's a, a heterogeneous network problem. Uh, you're gonna your system is gonna uh, adapt. Maybe you're on Wi-Fi. Uh, you add a, a BLC downlink that allows the Wi-Fi channel to, to have less traffic and less congestion. Uh, that, that, that's good. Um, you know, you, you could uh, go out of range of the um, uh, of the Wi-Fi and, and you pick up a carrier. So there's, there's a variety of combinations. Uh, no one is cooperative forwarding, forwarding. So you you might be out of range uh, of um, uh, and, and 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 set up a, a mobile ad hoc network whereby you're you're getting an RF from a neighboring signal as a way to bridge to some other gap. Um, and then, of course, carrier only. And so moving between these states is really um, uh, the, the realm of designing and tuning a protocol uh, so that this would uh, perform with low latency and, and, and no uh, discontinuities. Um, so I, I want to um, go through some of the work we've done recently and some of the results. Uh, I can give you some context here. And, and then um, I think I'm going to run out of time. So we've. Um, built these access points. Uh, this picture of Jimmy Chow uh, with a, a, a cage of these units. These are uh, uh, a, a, an older unit that we built back in 2008. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a transceiver. It actually communicates in, in two directions. It's got, um, it's got a receiver module here and then this, this lighting unit. And this was designed really as a proof of concept to demonstrate you can do this very inexpensively. These are, these are not complicated devices. Um, they're, they're USB based. Um, they're uh, very simple um, uh, on-off keying. And uh, so these are LEDs, right? So these are LEDs. They're white LEDs. They do about two megabits per second, with without any signal processing. Nothing, nothing special. Um, we have um, shortly thereafter we adapted these to do um, uh, handover, so we could set up a lighting array. This is a cage we're in. And uh, Kurt is holding a device and he's moving between uh, different lights to demonstrate how the, the, you know, the, the handover can be achieved with the devices. So it's it's uh, in, in terms of center goals, it was mobility uh, check check mark. We've demonstrated you can do, uh, mobility in this context. Interestingly, the receivers are very directional, so they they tend to um, to have a sharp cutoff as you move over. So you, you, know, you see one, see one light, see one light, see one light, and bam, you, you see the next one. So a sharp cutoff because the field of view of the receiver is narrow, and the field of view of the light also can be controlled. To have a very, very clear cutoff. Very little interference. The receiver, I assume, is a photodiode? It's a photo. It's actually three photodiodes. And so then the field of view is some function of a lens that's yes. happens to sit in front of that. Uh, so it's, it's actually the lens. They look like small LEDs. Um, uh, so it could be adjusted. It's, it's the these, these little guys. But it, it, off the shelf components, nothing, nothing exotic with that. Um, I, I mentioned the, the uh, tracking. Uh, the other thing we want to do in, in our test bed is um, understand what people are doing. And 
the more we know about what people are doing, the better we can target the light to meet the needs. Uh, and as an example, using the motion capture system, uh, we've collected data and, and using some unsupervised learning, we've, we built these, this graph which shows regions where people are doing different things. And this ends up being pretty, this is a, just a sketch of our, our, um, our lab. Um, this is pretty interesting because, you know, the sitting, it, those are places where you're going to find fixed position wireless. And we can think about provisioning the room statically based on this information or dynamically if, if we do have the ability to control the lights and steer the lights. And then the, the blue is the region where people are walking. Of course, the physical objects make this obvious. Um, but this could be gleaned from the system pretty quickly. Um, and then places where people are standing. Um, I know why people stand here, but I don't know. Well, I guess there's a chalkboard here. That's why they're standing here. I don't know what's going on there. Um, but, but you know, very first order approach. There's a lot of useful information that to, to optimize our system. Walking, sitting, standing. Couple dead transitions. Okay. Um, we've also investigated using uh, a, a, a light bounce as a way to communicate between devices. So if we really want to support uh, inner light communication without uh, you know, network infrastructure up in the ceiling. We need the lights to communicate with each other. So we, we've tried that, um, you know, assuming a, re a recessed luminaire model where the light bounces. Uh, this is a little hard to see. Um, this this uh, tripod has a light on it. Uh, that's the light in the inset. And there's a receiver. That's just an off-the-shelf receiver, which Mike is holding here. Um, <coughs> And on the screen, which we can't see, is, is a, you know, an illustration of how the signal is, in fact, getting through for this scenario. You'll notice that we've got a white uh, pad there that improves the reflectivity. Um, so we wanted to see if this is possible. And, and it turns out it wasn't, wasn't difficult at all. It was a very good signal. I think that the results would be different for something like a blog. This may not be. In order to make this work on a, on a broad basis, we might have to put reflectors in the rug material to be able to have the lights communicate each other. The value in this is that the lights can talk to each other and they can compare uh, sensed downward looking color measurements, which might be very useful for controlling the lights. So, do you use it you use it on the on off thing? Uh, it, this, this is using uh, OFTM, actually, this is nice. Uh, and, and that setup is um, all uh, um, software-defined radio, USRP-based. Um, um, and <clears throat> this next one is the same. So uh, uh, a lot of our work with the physical layer is to figure out how to um, how to get good spectral uh, use of the optical channel uh, and uh, how to integrate it with existing lighting systems. So when you say OFTM is like each of the subcarriers a different color, uh, what is OFTM here? Uh, uh, it's it's okay. So uh, it's intensity modulated. Let's start with that. So unlike RF, we're not controlling the the, you know, the fundamental carrier. We're we're um, with with light, which is terahertz. We're not operating at terahertz rates. We don't have the equipment to do that. <coughs> so instead, we uh, will modulate the intensity amplitude modulation of the light as though it's a continuous signal. It's not a continuous signal, but we modulate it that way. So it's, um, uh, it's intensity modulated, but we can embed subcarriers onto that in, in a la OFDF. So we can, we can do that. There's some interesting problems around uh, the peak to average power ratio, which tends to send the signal really high and cause clipping. Big, big problem with these optical systems. Um, <coughs> what do you mean is that instead of just a hard off and hard off, gets a soft division regions? Or it's, soft regions it's, um, it's operating within the linear region of the LED. Linear. Region, right? it's, it's positive. The signal can only be on up to some intensity level, and it can't be less than off. So we typically have to bias the signal. And then, and then amplitude modulate between zero and the maximum. So, what's the biggest advantage are you getting with this? Is it the multiple axis part? Is that uh, you are you getting some, more signals? You 
get some improvement uh, in, in how you, in, in actually in adopting some uh, signal chains that exist today. The one thing is, is widespread in, in Wi-Fi now. Uh, you also get some resilience from uh, multi-path. That's a, a, a side benefit. Um, and it's uh, pretty much what all of the optical wireless communication is going towards because of its efficient use of the spectrum. The uh, challenge, though, here that we're addressing is we want to be able to use OFDM and we want to be able to dim. So <clears throat> in lighting control, you want a range of intensity levels. But as you can imagine, if you reduce the intensity, you're also going to reduce your ability to modulate the data and get effective throughput. <coughs> you have an additional problem in that for the same reason you have clipping, the linear region of your lights has a maximum. So you can go as low as zero off, and you can go as high as the brightest that the LED can do before it saturates. That's the linear region. So you can't go higher than that. So when you design your modulation, it's got to be somewhere in the middle, not higher than the peak and not lower than zero. Um, so when you're dimming, you want the average power in the LED to go closer to zero or closer to the peak. But you can't go higher than the peak. So as you increase the, the light, make it brighter and brighter, your operating range shrinks for the signal as it shrinks when you go down to, to zero, because the, the amplitude range you're working with is very small. So the, as, the, as the average value goes up, your operating range becomes very small. Uh, so dimming is a, is a bit of a challenge. Uh, this uh, uh, scheme was developed to uh, try to overlay OFDM into those two cases by, by mixing it with pulse width modulation. So pulse of modulation changes the average power of the signal. Um, and that's what's being demonstrated here. Um, the, the, the basic idea is you get your OFDM signal, you get your pulse of modulation, and you want to combine them somehow. But one way would be to overlay the data onto this period. Um, another way would be to overlay the data onto this period, but that doesn't make sense because that, that's supposed to be zero. Um, so we, we had this crazy idea that turned out to work, which is to overlay it onto both periods. Um, so we, we just drive the data from the max down during the high period and drive the data from zero up during that phase. And, and we're able to get a, a decent dimming range. So we can dim from around 10% uh, up to around 90%, which is pretty good. Um, and it turns out your eye perceives that a little bit differently. So the dimming, it, it's easier to do the higher end than the lower end because your eyes become, have a, a nonlinear sensitivity to light. As it gets darker, they become more sensitive. Um, but the real benefit is that this is easy to integrate into existing um, uh, PDO, PWM lighting controls. Uh, and this just shows up here as, as um, you know, we, we can make it adaptive. Um, so if we are willing to change the modulation order, we can um, make it work at the ends. Whereas in the middle, we get the, the best performance. So the middle of the range, intuitively, would be where you get the best performance. Um, I mentioned we're using an asymmetric channel. Um, this is an example of a, a USRP setup to demonstrate video streaming. This is uh, one machine that captures video. Uh, we use the um, uh, GNU radio in this case, although we're now using uh, uh, Simulink. Uh, data getting coded in real time. Uh, the light is uh, modulated about 10 megabits per second, sent down to a receiver here, and then played back in real time with the reverse process. So it's an asymmetric link. Uh, there's no handshaking, uh, and, and you get decent uh, data delivery. Uh, this is operating about 10 megabits per second, but our goal is to move up to about a gigabit per second. So a lot of our work is directed at achieving much higher gain rates. We've investigated using um, diversity receivers. So this is essentially the same setup I just showed you um, with a receiver that has um, five LEDs that point in different directions. So in, in some ways, it's similar to what, what you showed us for the angle of arrival. 
We're looking in different directions. And this is much more robust to occlusion. So you put your hand in front of this, and, and it doesn't uh, immediately shut off. Uh, that's a picture of me taking the picture. Um, that's a picture of the foosball table in the back, which is uh, a popular hangout, like your water cooler here. Uh, we also have the possibility of exploiting multiple cells. So this is the one user per cell model. And this is the, this is the multiple cells per user model. <clears throat> so one, one thing that I think uh, uh, Qualcomm is talking about is moving from uh, one cell, multiple users, one cell, one user, and then multiple cells, one user. And, and that's, that's a MIMO configuration. Uh, that's where you start to get in the realm of wanting cameras to do uh, the, the uh, optical communication and perspective distortions and the like become very important in how you design these things. Uh, we've demonstrated a, a, a two by two system um, here and um, with, with luminaires built by our partner at Tufts. Here's an example of the luminaires with a, our uh, imaging receiver. I use the term imaging receiver uh, loosely. Uh, it has four uh, photo detectors. Okay. But the, we have an effort to increase this uh, substantially. The limit, I think, is going to be uh, the, the, the practicalities of getting um, of many uh, parallel streams operating in, in the you know 50 to 100 megabit per second range. And you start to have some um, practically some throughput issues on how you handle that much data in a, in a homegrown device. But uh, imaging optics, imaging sensors, using uh, multiple spatially separated devices. Uh, we have, um, we, we would like to move towards uh, what we're calling a unit device. That would be uh, one of these things, these are called troffers, where we set out a plan to replace all of the tiles with a unit device that is able to do RGBAY uh, with the goal of making each one of the color channels a separate VLC channel. So we have the, uh, we increase the, uh, the number of parallel channels into the wavelength division domain and be able to achieve all the lighting control functions and then be able to stream data from each one of these with the different colors. Um, I, I looked at your orbit lab and I thought, ooh, that looks a lot like what we want to do. Um, and, and here's an example. So we want this array of units each, which could be a single wireless, optical wireless cell with multiple channels, or they could be aggregated, as is shown here, where uh, those nine units are all contributing uh, to data streams that come down onto a receiver. And um, uh, unlike what we heard this morning, we're thinking not uh, about using RF King, but using OFDM for all of those channels. So we end up with needing uh, uh, signal chains that are, have a lot of parallelism to, to handle the, the decoding operations. <coughs> This is a picture that captures the uh, functional components of the tile device. Um, you know, optical front end, it's modular, some control electronics right now, these FPGAs, Ethernet interface, and then sensors, things that might support the activity recognition in the space to improve the mission of, of delivering light. Um, and then you start to stack these up. Um, and you can get what you have out of the next room. It's an array with a lot of uh, network connections. Um, and then a, you know, a control architecture where um, a lot of different things come together in terms of the sensing, the actuation, the activity classification, um, and then you know, interfacing with mobile devices and, and connecting to cloud-based services. Um, so you know, uh, kind of running out of time here, um, in, in summary, um, I believe that the demand for this is going to be motivated by this, this insatiable demand. If you look at the, um, the last 10 years, the growth in, uh, in, in, in need for wireless access has it's been tremendous. 10 years ago, the carriers wouldn't have thought about offloading traffic. They wanted to charge for every bit. Um, but but they realized that offloading is well, it's real value in terms of the quality of service provided and experience for users. And the projections are just to see this grow uh, continuously. 
Um, the offload, I mentioned, that seems to be the direction, the smaller and smaller cells. That's clearly happening in the RF world. Uh, you know, can we can we make it work for uh, the optical uh, medium? Well, we'll see. Um, I think the, the directionality ends up being a real uh, value add here for achieving high density. So we think that the uh, light-based access is, is both opportunistic, it's in the right place, and it has the right characteristics to, to reduce congestion and increase capacity at the same time. Um, and that's where I'll stop. I'll take some questions. Thank you. When you put the, the light to light uh, bouncing off the table, yep. the intensity will be very different if they're equal beta uh, specular maximum that you communicate to this one and this one over here. Yes. Is that an issue? Do you account for that? Um, uh, so we, we did some simulations on, on uh, we, we took an array uh, just like this, we said an array of lights, and uh, the simulation environment allows us to do this. And we, um, we with just a standard um, down looking, no, no angular control, uh, but a, a down looking land version order or something or other, but they're all uniform. We wanted to see how the light propagated across the room. So we did basically did an impulse response. Uh, uh, from each light, measuring how the light uh, reflected and propagated through the room. And we found uh, that it's quite robust. Now, you, you, know, you can change the simulation environment, make the surfaces more or less reflective. Uh, but the, but the it's highly gloss, for instance, the, the, the light that is um, placed at the angle data with respect to the surface. It, it, will, it will change dramatically, okay. yes. So we, we didn't do an exhaustive simulation of those cases. But um, there was some good news and bad news. So what we wanted, I mean, if we could wish for anything, it would be uh, communicate only with my neighbors. So we were worried that it would communicate too far. And in fact, that's what it did. But I think it was a simulation. So I think in practice, you have a lot of attenuation. Uh, we, we also learned that the corners, if you have a light in the corner, it tended to uh, project well across the room because the light hits the side and gets reflected out. Um, and that could be beneficial or not. You know, I think, uh, some of these things, as we, as we test fed them, we realize you can exploit these characteristics or, or you have to make it. Instead of using 12 cameras, why don't you use ultrasound sonic sensors? Uh, absolutely. And, and in fact, uh, there's a variety of modalities that could be used for indoor position. Uh, could be could be camera based. Uh, ours, ours, the, the ones we're using are uh, very high precision, but I don't think that you need that kind of precision. So if you're if you're within 10 or 20 centimeters. Uh, for, for tracking humans, that's probably way more than enough. So ultrasonic could be a way to do it. Uh, you could use RF, the RF techniques that exist. Uh, an important requirement, though, is that the position, the positioning cover the entire space. So things like the, the Connect device are really, uh, you stand in front of it for gesture recognition and so forth. Uh, the requirement is that it really span the whole space. So that somebody in the back room can raise their hand, and that's detected by the system, and you know it shows up on my monitor. So you, you want a very broad field of view of that. Uh, one technique that, that my colleagues are investigating is time of flight. Time of flight from each light will send a signal down and, and reflect off heads. So you can tell who's scanning, who's sitting, and get more information out. But there's there's um, different ways that that problem can be solved. Second question is, you look for the same brand of LEDs and in the same uh, in the same shirt levels fitted, they, they have different intensity levels. Yes, they do. How do you overcome that? Why, why would I want to overcome that? I mean, for different uh, LEDs, if you want to send some data, you want to, when you 
receive that signal, it might be the, how, you, how you know what they actually send the signal. Um, uh, okay. One of, the, one of the reasons that that, that matters is visually, your, your eyes can see uh, that the lights are different color. That, that's an important consideration. Uh, and, 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 and LEDs vary a lot. Uh, so uh, a, a strategy to mitigate that from a lighting standpoint is to measure the incident value and then to adjust the relative intensities of two, two lights or LEDs. For the communication, uh, it's, it's entirely possible to dynamically uh, adjust the intensity to some normal level. Uh, when we think about driving them, you think about a, a generic linear region of the LED, and we can apply a voltage onto that LED and manipulate the full range. So if we wanted to change the output intensity, we could do it based on an input signal uh, or for an average uh, level which would control the intensity. So the, 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 the uh, modulated signal on the, on the LEDs is not visible through the eye. It's the average power is visible through the eye. And we can control that. You had briefly mentioned this 2x2 two two MIMO prototype that you have. I think it was a prototype, right? 2x2 two two MIMO? Yes. And in the diagram, it seemed like a you have two photodiode receivers on the table and two lamps in the ceiling? Uh, we had two lamps because we didn't have four lamps. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around that. Can you can you use MIMO in a multiplexing mode in this case? Or is it only diversity operation that we need? No, uh, uh, it's similar to, to the, the uh, camera-based techniques using a lens. Using a lens. Yes. So the photodiodes are speed. We, we have we have two two lights and through the lens. Yeah, the light a big lens over there. Ends up. Um, oh, it's, landing fo on. it's focused so that it lands. Yes. 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 And and if you look at that, you can immediately uh, envision a whole set of problems. You know, if I tip it, you know, it's no you longer. If you just move in a slight amount, so it has to be perfectly aligned. As we move uh, into the future, we want to have a pixel array which allows to do positioning uh, for all the reasons we heard about. And it has the ability to uh, manage a, a wider field of view and multiple streams. So we think that I think current FPGA solutions can handle order 25 to 100 channels. I mean, that's a pretty, that's a, that's a lot. Um, are we going to put that in every phone? We're not there. But, but that's where the research is going, is the ability to support um, at least three colors. Uh, so we've investigated uh, what are the right colors for us that will lead to good color separation at the receiver with low loss optical filtering. That's another problem. But you, you start with the problem of, of the, the spatial separation and, and MIMO with, with spatially distinct sources. I'm also curious, uh, you showed a lot of hardware prototypes. And are these being built in the university setting? Who's they are. That? They are. Um, students? Uh, well, um, uh, hmm. so this device we, we designed, prototyped, and we set out for fabrication. We can fabricate those by writing a check. Uh, these we designed, we prototyped, and we said, you know, We've got all these students, we can build these. It turns out that, that building devices like that that require um, service mount and, and baking ovens and things like that are not good student projects. Um, we, we suffered immensely putting together 15 of those, and, and we would have been much better off outsourcing the fabrication. So I think in the future, for anything that um, we have to replicate, we'll, we'll just fabricate outside. It's, it's not that expensive. So when you say fabricate, that means the PCB board, or is it a double encasing device? Uh, we're, we're just doing board level solutions. Board level. Some of our colleagues also do <coughs> chip level solutions, but the lead time is, is much longer. So, for example, we want to build a new imager, and we don't 
come up with a new architecture for that's not a camera, but is optimized for uh, uh, capturing uh, analog levels for OPM with a sample and hold mechanism that allows us to only use the pixels for some uh, peak number of streams. So if you say we're going to have nine streams, we want a pixel array which is bigger than nine. Uh, that's some of my questions this morning about you know, what would you, you know, what about a beam that comes in and lands on multiple pixels or doesn't, you know, how big do you want the pixel to be? So it's, it's, um, it's both a layout question, a sensitivity question, noise question, also a architectural one because the, uh, the, the number of wires to get the signal out of the array is, is problematic in terms of how you get the image. It, it, there's there's uh, real estate problems. Uh, so it's, it's a, uh, a cross-layer problem. <laughs> That's what you say in that one. Uh, yeah, so we, we try to outsource that. Um, we're also investigating, this is our, our lighting cage. Yeah, you don't, I don't see the cameras. No, I think the cameras are up there somewhere. Um, inside that cage. So earlier you talked about uh, having the uh, light tracking somewhere. Yes. My question was more from just a usability standpoint. Of, can you use that in situations where you're comfortable with having a spotlight following someone? Well, you can control the um, intensity of that light. So there, there could be a case where that's OK for lighting purposes. So uh, uh, suppose I, um, you know, I, I, I sit down here. Um, I have a light be directed to my magazine. That be, that's a, that's a, a tasking of the light that has value. So we think that baking that into the lighting is a good thing. And then for the, um, for the optical communications, the, the direction this is going, I think, is well, we can do that with visible light and we'll embed data in it to improve the quality of the signal. Uh, but in the future, we might actually make it a, a, an IR beam or a laser. And I, I have the ability to you know, go to even higher rates with, with these other uh, uh, My one other question is, uh, these are all sort of direct light sources. Yes. And for example, all of the installations here are diffuse light sources. Yes. And, that's, and diffuse light sources seem to be sort of the current standard for lighting. It's, it's actually a mix. It's, it's both. So this room has got um, some direct lighting over here. Well, that's that's uh, wash, whatever it's called, wash. <coughs> Uh, but a lot of rooms will have a mix of these troffers and then um, downlights. Um, we've clearly been thinking about the downlights. It's also possible to use these troffers. In fact, the demo that we had for, uh, that I showed a little bit earlier, was uh, a troffer. That's, that's one of these units, slightly different style, which is diffuse. And uh, it, it works as well. Um, I think it's, it's you know, by design, it's diffused. So, so, it's so when the light is on at whatever level, right, and you're doing sort of your data transmission, can yes. you actually feel something? Can you tell something? You cannot. No. It's your, your eye is sensitive to you know, 120 hertz, maybe. And then if you go below that, you can trigger epilepsy and things like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> You're doing it uh, two megahertz. It, it, you know, it, it, the, the LEDs are um, a white LED is good for about three megahertz. Sweet. Uh, and if you if you work with the blue part and you, you focus on the blue, you can get ten to twenty megahertz. And if you do um, uh, you know bandwidth extension techniques of various kinds, you, you can get. You can get and, and there's good opportunity there because if, if you um, use high voltage LEDs, they, these so the lighting LEDs are not like the ones you find on, in, in uh, other applications that are kind of the ones with lights. These are high currents. The typical lighting LED is, is uh, 300 to 400 milliamps per 
per, per single unit. And a, you know, a typical light bulb will have maybe um, you know, three to five of these. So there's a, there's a lot of current to control. Um, and that and, and the inductance capacities that, that make the modulation more difficult. Um, you can't slew them very quickly. So one, one strategy is to go to high voltage LEDs that operate at, at 15 volt to 90 volts. Um, and then uh, you, you reduce the current to get synthetic behaviors. Or use many small LEDs, which have low capacitance, micro LEDs, but in aggregate can produce more light. In fact, one clever technique is to use uh, you know, a very large number as an array and to uh, modulate them on and off. So you do an on off mode, uh, but you use them like a digital analog converter. So the light output can be an analog signal with the summation of the light uh, from, from the many LEDs. Just like a, an optical DAC 